Okay, it is 5.02. And so I will bring a regular meeting of the school board into session. Uh, first up on our agenda this evening, uh, 1A is, or 1B is the establishment of the agenda. I move we establish the agenda as published. I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the agenda is established. We will move now on to 1C, recognition. Uh, tonight, uh, it's exciting to have so many people here. We are uh, recognizing Employees of the Year Awards and our retiring staff. So I'll turn it over to you, Superintendent Koloski. Thank you. This is one of my favorite um, board meetings of the year as, as well. It's always such a joy to congratulate those who are um, retiring and then also, of course, congratulate our Employees of the Year. We're going to start with the retirees, and I would ask the board to join me here in front of the podium so they can greet our retirees when, um, and congratulate them when they come up. And we're going to start a little bit differently this year because we have a retiree that we would like to recognize who actually isn't technically a Mercer Island School District employee. And I would like to ask Kathy Gentino to come and join me here. <laughs> As many of you know, Kathy works with Mercer Island Youth and Family Services and she is one of our counselors at Mercer Island High School. She's worked with our students and their families for over the past 33 years and it has truly been amazing. She works behind the scenes on delicate matters, helping students and parents who need counseling support and a friendly listening ear. Kathy has been a leader in helping our staff to have the tools necessary to learn more about suicide prevention. Kathy also volunteered over the years to be a club advisor for some of our student-driven clubs like GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance. Kathy's warm, caring presence has helped to calm many situations throughout her time at Mercer Island High School. The partnership with MIYFS has been consistent all these years because of Kathy's work throughout her tenure at MIHS. We wish Kathy all the best in the next chapter of retirement. Congratulations. And now our MISD retirees in alphabetical order. First up, I would like Bar Bonnie Barthelme from Islander Middle School to come and join me. Bonnie has been our Islander Middle School nurse and the ultimate caretaker at IMS. Students always found their way to her, not only for aches and pains, but also for mental health and wellness. She brought a sense of humor and directness to the job, first at Lake Ridge and then at IMS, over 22 years that kept students and staff on their toes. She is adventurous and outgoing and always shared her learning with our school community. Her kindness and caring will always keep her connected with the fabric of IMS. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank And now also from Islander Middle School, Jan Rousseau. <laughs> J 
Jan has been at Islander Middle School teaching French and has also been our English language learner teacher. She's been an amazing teacher and collaborator and has truly been dedicated to improving teaching. She has gravitated to leadership roles throughout her 28 year career on Mercer Island. 28 years, that's what they tell me. And has maintained an excitement and energy over the years that is honorable. Oh, well. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> she always chooses strategies, routines, activities, and new technology that require students in her room to do the hard work of thinking and learning, making them in charge of their learning process. She regularly and naturally reflects on her work and makes deliberate decisions to improve experiences for kids every time. She has served as a mentor to countless new teachers and has worked closely with the French teachers at the high school, aligning expectations and content so that students have similar experiences no matter when they take French. She has served as the IMS ELL teacher, meeting with her elementary and high school counterparts and attends outside trainings. She works with teachers who have ELL students in their gener general education courses. She helps teachers strategize about ways to accommodate the needs of the students while supporting them and helping them to acclimate to the Islander culture. And I know she will be missed at Islander Middle School. So thank you very much, I Jan. <laughs> Next up is Bill Harris. So there is Bill. <laughs> Bill Harris started with transportation in 2001 as a bus driver. He drove a big bus route for many years before moving to a special ed route. Always looking for ways to serve the district, Bill also worked at the middle school in the lunchroom, in the nurses' room, and in the bus load zone at the end of the day, assisting both students and bus drivers. After just three years as a bus driver, Bill took on the role of driver instructor, where he worked with other instructors to train new bus drivers. And in 2008, Bill received the Driver of the Year Award in the Transportation Department. Bill has served the district for 18 years, and here's an amazing fact. In that time, he has not missed one day of work due to illness. <laughs> Bill has always taken a special interest in his students, getting to know each one of them by name. And after 18 years of driving, that's over 1,500 names. As a longtime resident of the island, Bill often attends sporting events to support the students and is recognized by students, staff, and parents alike. He has served the district well, and we wish him the best and will miss him terribly. Congratulations, Bill. <laughs> Carol Krell. Who doesn't know Carol Krell, our Islander music teacher? She always goes above and beyond to keep her band students engaged in their learning and loving all things related, even at the back of the parade line. She's keeping them all in front of her. She's been a strong advocate for the music program in her 14 years on Mercer Island and works tirelessly to develop, enhance, and celebrate the music program. We all know she works hard to prepare students for concerts and performances, and she's given up a great deal of her own free time to travel in support of the band. We constantly hear from students that Miss Krell is one of their favorite teachers and that she even makes boring things fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's music, how can it be boring? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> she is patient, kind, and always willing to work with students when they're when there are issues that have arisen within the band department. Carol, along with her team, I see them up there, <laughs> is always trying to find new ways for the band to entertain our student body and community, and she will be sorely missed by her teammates and all of us. Congratulations, Carol. <laughs> Thank you. 
Trish O'Malley. <laughs> Trish O'Malley is um, retiring from Islander Middle School as a paraeducator. She is a special ed para who supports students in the resource room as well as in the general ed classrooms at IMS. She thoughtfully engages in interactions with every staff member and student she encounters. Beyond just mentally and physically being present during the school day, Trish is always actively thinking about how can she support everyone around her. Her aid is not just in the moment support, but truly thinking about future actions. She has a smile that just lights up her room, and she can often be found sitting next to a student giving prompts and supportive advice. I've seen her doing that. Trish is a quiet leader who has a wealth of knowledge and true understanding about how to work with struggling students. She's retiring after 18 years at IMS. We will miss her sense of humor and optimism, and we will miss being able to go to her for advice. Congratulations, That's Trish. Right. And Jan Sayers from Mercer Island High School. <laughs> Jan has been such an inspiration to many of her students in her more than 30 years at Mercer Island High School. She taught the English 9 and Business Communications block for nearly 30 years and was honored as the District Teacher of the Year in 2009 and as a Seattle Seahawks hero in the classroom in 2010. I loved that picture of her in the jersey. I think it was bigger than her. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, she was once the leading scorer in an exhibition game featuring the Harlem Globetrotters at MIHS. It <laughs> 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 raised more than $40,000 for the band. <laughs> Jan knows the craft of teaching writing very well, and she made sure all of her students mastered this important skill. There are many times when Jan met with students outside of class who struggled in her classes to help them be become better writers. She never allowed her students to be quitters. Jan has been viewed by her students to be a tough grader, but very fair. She continues to follow how her students are doing beyond high school and has maintained a positive, caring relationship with them as adults. We wish Jan the very, very best in her well-deserved retirement. Congratulations. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to recognize our employees of the year for 2019, starting with our classified employees of the year. And I would like Jay Little, our dispatcher in the transportation department, to come on up and join me. Jay is the MISD Transportation Department's unsung hero and behind the scenes wizard who daily manages to orchestrate the complex dance of students, drivers, and buses with kindness, patience, and resourcefulness. For many students, their days start and end with their bus, drive, bus ride and our drivers believe they are there to be the positive beginning and end of their students' day. The bus drivers can be their best with Jay, at the mic as the dispatcher and their anchor for a safe harbor. He expertly manages to keep all routes staffed, even when it appears there's not enough drivers or subs to fill the routes on some days. Jay works through the stressful situations that can arise suddenly in the whirlwind world of student transportation. Whether it's a concerned parent on the phone whose student might be on the wrong bus, 
or a driver experienced a mechanical issue, Jay will jump into action and get the problem solved. There are times when all of these things can occur simultaneously and he'll be juggling two phone lines and the dispatch to radio or dispatch to bus radio to multiple drivers during a typical afternoon. Whether on the phone or over the radio, Jay's voice remains calm and focused. <laughs> Jay takes care and energy to create the special needs routes so that students on routes that best meets so that students are on routes that best meets their needs for their programs and home locations. Congratulations. We are so honored to have you as one of our employee of the year. My friend Karen Hubbard. Who's <laughs> <Ms>. Karen? <laughs> uh, just a little personal note. Um, my earliest mornings at the district office, it's very rarely that I beat Karen there. And she's always one of the first places that I visit because I know I'll get a smile to start my day. Karen does her work in a calm and efficient way and never makes you feel like you are causing a problem. There are so many dynamics to ordering, traveling, field trips, speakers, specific materials needed to run a program, just to name a few. She is so knowledgeable, she can always lead you in the right direction. Karen deals with seven schools and she makes you feel like you are the only one with an issue when you call. She works around things when needed to get things done. Sometimes it's hard for someone that has not worked in a school to totally understand how many balls you have in the air that are just waiting to be dropped, but Karen always understands. And even when you do something wrong, mess up an order, forget an order, or make one of the million mistakes that any of us can make, she never makes you feel bad. She just starts working on the issue to get it done or fixed as soon as possible. Karen is looked up to at the admin building. She takes care of people, and that is such an important trait when this world does not always have a lot of that sometimes. So we are all so grateful for Karen and her presence at, at the district and her service to everyone. So thank you, Karen. Last up, Classified Employee of the Year, Liz Kuhn from Northwood Elementary. <laughs> Liz is the PALS, Practicing and Learning Skills Coach for Northwood, part of the multi-tiered systems of support for behavior learning. As such, she builds authentic, effective relationships with kids who are struggling with specific behaviors and or self-regulation skills. She creates individual individualized plans for them, identifying target goals and providing daily feedback and encouragement to her students. She is extraordinarily flexible and she maintains a calm and caring demeanor when supporting a dysregulated and or escal escalated student. Those are education ease words for those of you. <laughs> it is evident that Liz enjoys her work and that she genuinely cares about all the students on her roster. She is thoughtful about her work with each child and she collaborates effectively with teachers and staff throughout the school building to support her learning, her learners. And we are so glad and grateful that she is here with us to be recognized. Thank you, Liz. And now for our Teachers of the Year, starting with Islander Middle School Teacher of the Year, Julie Biggs. <laughs> <laughs> J 
Julie is described as artist, teacher, and leader. Julie's dedication to student enrichment is awe-inspiring. She embodies the idea of lifelong learner. She sets high expectations for herself and for her students. Her curriculum is always evolving as she finds ways for students to engage in creating art that is relevant and connected to the issues of today. Her students are so fortunate to have a teacher that is so devoted to her craft and instilling that passion in others. Julie is a natural leader and has worked to bring together the electives teachers at IMS in a way that makes sense and pushes a variety of teachers to see how working together can benefit adults and students alike. This year, she partnered with a community artist and a writer in order to create an experience for students that was completely out of the box, the Lego superheroes. And I think we're all familiar with that. It was a project that was featured at the Mercer Island Community Center and is still there if you want to take a look, and also at the Foundation Breakfast of Champions. So thank you, Julie, to your service for our students. We really appreciate you. Parker Bixby. <laughs> what to say, Parker, what to say. Everybody knows Parker Bixby. <laughs> In a good way. Parker's commitment to all of his students over the years he has taught at MIHS is phenomenal. His students report that he's caring and inspires them to do their best. He has a ton of energy, and I can attest to that, and has put our band program on the international map of recognition, especially including its selection in the most recent Tournament of Roses Parade. But Parker does so much more than teach band for our students and with our students. I'm, I know that he teaches them um, the love of music, but he really teaches them about compassion and empathy and has taught his students what that means to be compassionate about what they do in life and how to serve their community far beyond the music that they play together. An amazing example of the leadership opportunities Parker has given his students is the annual band Food Drive and of course this year the support work with the Puerto Rico Banda Escolar de Guyanilla that we all know was devastated in the hurricane. And he just returned, that's a little bit of yeah. tan, um, from Guayanillo where he was honored by them as the Grand Marshal in the city's carnival. <laughs> Parker's unwavering support of his students has followed them through their lives as they grow up. He is truly a leader among leaders in the teaching profession and an, as a fellow music teacher, an absolute joy to watch, teach, and work with students. So Parker, thank you so much for your, all of your work at the Mercer Island High School. Unfortunately, our um, last teacher of the year at the elementary level is not able to be here because she is with students at um, Destination Imagination Finals Global. So I'm still going to read about her and we're going to make sure that she gets recognized at the school side as well because she is truly amazing. Chris Coughlin Ray from West Mercer Elementary. Chris is an exemplary teacher and leader. Her work is always focused on students, their academic and social emotional needs, and how she can meet those needs. She inspires others, students and staff, through her positive attitude, infectious enthusiasm, and thoughtful, well-researched lessons. She also builds strong relationships with students, staff, and families. It is not unheard of for Chris to spend her planning time co-teaching in another staff member's classroom, 
that is how much she values students and teaching and thereby learning. She has been the West Mercer School cheerleader for welcoming and embracing innovative teaching approaches that will lead students to deep learning and understanding. She has successfully promoted these approaches with other teachers and thus extending her reach beyond her classroom. Students love being in her classroom. They know she cares about them and knows who they are, each and every one, as an individual. So congratulations to Chris as well. So now it is that photo opportunity. Could we have, do you want everyone or do you want the retirees first? If the retirees wouldn't mind coming up here with our, our board, come on, all of you. Don't make me read your names again. <laughs> At this time, uh, the board is going to recess for a half an hour uh, so that everybody can mingle. Uh, we have some refreshments over here. Please enjoy them. And congratulations to all the people who were uh, honored here tonight. Uh, the board will reconvene at 6 o'clock.
Okay, it is 6.01 and we are returning from recess uh, to continue on with our regular meeting. Um, so we will move now to uh, section 1D, public input. Is there any public input tonight? Anyone? Okay, seeing none, then we will move on to section 1E, superintendent's report. Before we move to the um, high cap review that Jamie's going to go through with us, I have a couple of items that I would like to um, inform the board of. First up, we just received notification this week of the um, OSPI new recognition system. Last week, the State Board of Education released the names of Washington schools who are receiving awards for growth and achievement as well as progress towards closing opportunity gaps among students groups. Over the past year, the Office OSPI, State Board of Education and Education Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee created a new system of recognizing and celebrating schools achievement on the Washington School Improvement Framework measures, also known as WSIF. We talked to the board about that a few meetings ago. The new system places more emphasis on schools who are making progress, closing opportunity gaps among student groups, as well as schools who have lower levels of achievement but are seeing high levels of progress. Um, recognized schools measure within the top 20% on the WSIF measures and are making significant progress closing gaps among student groups. And on June 6th, these schools will be honored in concurrent ceremonies in Olympia and Spokane. And I am pleased to announce that West Mercer has received this recognition in high achievement in English language arts and math, as well as the school quality or student success indicators, as has Island Park received this recognition. So a new uh, recognition system, and we are proud of our two schools that are being recognized for the inaugural award. Um, next up, as you are well aware, we have experienced a measles outbreak in our region. And so just to let the board know that we have put in place an administrative policy for an infection control program um, and a procedure for this that is pertinent to staff and how um, we're gonna work with staff to assure their safety when it comes to communicable diseases, including, of course, measles. Um, it's, it's tricky because there's so, it's actually harder for us to identify staff that would need to be excluded versus students because many staff, I'll use myself as an example, do not have a record of our immunization. And so we've given them the information as to how to um, gain that information or get the test that says if you are immune. And I am pleased to announce that I am immune to measles, but believe it or not, not mumps. So I will be getting the vaccination. <laughs> and now I'm going to turn it over to um, Jamie, who is going to give you an update on the high cap review that we presented um, last year. We did the full review, and she's been working with um, our work group and is gonna give you a little update on some of their work this year. All right, so I took the slides that you were presented with earlier this year and distilled them down just to one slide. Um, and Fred, if you scroll up, there were really five key areas of focus um, that the review looked at and had recommendations for us in, um, those being program design, collaboration, professional development, uh, differentiating for social emotional learning and health, and then equity and access. So the next slide. Sorry for all the words, I will go through them and, and hopefully elaborate a little bit. Um, on the left hand side, that is what we uh, have been working on this year. So we convened the high cap advisory committee. That committee is comprised of parents of students who receive high cap services and parents who do not, of teachers who, ad who are high cap teachers, teachers who are gen ed teachers, administrators at a school that has a high cap program and administrators from schools who do not. So we try to get a, a cross section of all different stakeholders as it pertains to meeting the needs of our highly capable students. Um, that committee has met twice so far. We have another meeting coming up next week and that's our third and final meeting of the year. 
And our task at really year zero was to digest the report, figure out what is in there, what are the recommendations, and what does that mean for us moving forward. And so we did an activity on identifying shared values. We then brought in um, Ronnie and Greg who came and presented to you when we did the high cap review. And they came in and answered questions to the committee. And then the next thing we're gonna do is cover our planning needs for next year. As far as professional learning this year, um, we sent several instructional coaches to a UDL conference, a Universal Design for Learning. Um, and it's important to note here at this point where, and I think uh, Dr. Riddle talked about this when he talked about the special education review update, uh, that these really can't be done in isolation because if we're looking at all children, if we're looking at the needs, if we're looking at inclusion, least restrictive, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're not siloing and that we're really um, cross-identifying needs and areas for us to work on. And so the UDL conference actually came to us from the special education department and we sent people to look and see what does that really mean for all students, not just students who receive special education services. Additionally, I went and I worked with Dr. Baghetto from UConn and he came and he was in Spokane and went to a conference there about gifted learners and, and teaching strategies and things like that. And then we are really excited about our June and July conferences and we are sending a number of instructional coaches and teacher to the Teachers College at Columbia University. And if you look at the titles, so the first is Differentiated Instruction for Gifted Students in the Heterogeneous Classroom. And so one of our charges is to figure out how to differ differentiate and meet the needs of all students. And uh, from a teacher perspective, it's a little bit daunting to figure out that I've got students who run a gamut of different needs and abilities and how do I meet those needs when I already have seven different curricula that I've got to implement and I'm working on behavior and social emotional learning, et cetera. So really looking at how we meet those needs through differentiation. We've got three coaches going and um, a science teacher covering a variety of different levels. Then the following week, I'm gonna go to the same conference and I'm gonna meet with a man named James Borland. He's the head of the department there at Columbia who looks specifically at gifted ed. His PhD is in gifted education and he is giving a workshop and conference on the various models used to serve the needs of students with um, gifted talents, giftedness and talents. And um, he has agreed to come and work with us next year as well. So I'm gonna attend his conference, meet with him, talk about kind of where we are, what our needs are, our community, and then he's willing to come and work with our staff, with our parents and community about the different service model, delivery models that are available and what might best fit our needs. Um, because as you can imagine, and I'm sure you hear, people are deeply entrenched in what they know, and I think it's important for us to explore what our options are and what will best meet the needs of all students. We also have one of our instructional coaches traveling to Carol Ann Tomlinson's differentiation conference. Um, Carol Ann Tomlinson, for those of you who don't know, is very big in differentiation. Um, so we're excited to send Julie to that. And then, like I said, we have James Borland coming here um, this next year to work and collaborate with us. Additionally, we've got, we were told at the very beginning of our process that one of the things we needed to do was we had specifically in our two elementary programs, two different programs really is what they came back to say that um, Blake Ridge and West Mercer and the way that they operate their high cap programs was significantly different and that was creating some rustling some feathers um, within families and teachers and students about their high cap experience. And so one of the first recommendations from Greg and Ronnie was to make sure that we try to align our practices so that students who receive high cap services, no matter where they attend, receive a similar experience. So er, very early in the year, we got the teams from both of those schools together to talk about homework expectations, to talk about um, delivery methods and things like that. So they've been working on making sure, you know, it's not a perfect system yet, we still have a ways to go, but they've at least begun those conversations to align their expectations. And then we've also, Dr. Renner and I have been working with the 512 math review committee, so that's grades five through 12, and looking at making sure that the pathways that we provide for students specifically in math, which is one of the early areas identified for students who receive PEP and high cap services, um, best meet their needs. And that we, um, we've got a great committee who's doing a lot of heavy lifting and we're excited. So we've begin, begun that work this year. 
as we look ahead to next year, we need to identify ways that we are going to share this incredible information that we're gonna be gleaning as we attend conferences in June and July. And we have our instructional coaches and they're gonna be tasked with sharing that information and disseminating it back to the staff. We have James Borland who's agreed to come and work with us and our community and staff. We have Cassie Martin, so again, jumping back to that um, cross sections between high cap and special education. She uh, has come and worked with many of our schools on inclusion and what that looks like and how we can make that a reality. And so she's gonna continue working with us. There is the National Association of Gifted Children Conference in November. So we'll look to send some different coaches and representatives to that to bring back information about specifically about how to teach gifted students. We need to revise our identification process. So one of the things that came out in the review was that we need to include a behavioral component. So we look, we use the ITBS test as an achievement test, we use the COGAT test as a cognitive test, but we didn't have anything that looked at behavior. Um, and so we do in the PEP portfolio process when students are in grades K, one and two, we use the gifted rating scale, but we haven't extended that into high cap, so we need to look at how we can make it manageable and feasible to bring a third point into those conversations and determinations. We are also then going to begin looking at our model and figuring out with the support of James Borland, Columbia U and Teachers College, um, Cassie Martin, looking at a model that will best meet the needs of all of our students. Um, again, both special education and highly capable services, how, how we can achieve that and then what that's gonna look like moving forward. As far as collaboration goes, uh, we're gonna need to increase the frequency that the committee or the advisory committee meets next year because now that we've had some opportunity to, to digest what is there, we're gonna begin to bring professional learning back to that group to talk about what, what needs to be and, and how we make those changes if there are changes that need to be made. So our subcommittees will be about the different models, professional learning, and then collaboration. And then finally, we're gonna continue the alignment of our current model because before we make any change, we need to make sure that we continue what we're doing to the best of our ability and so we'll continue getting, especially our two elementary programs together, talking about ways that we can make sure that we are consistent and aligned. Any questions? Thank you for that. Yeah, a few questions. Thank you. This was this is this is helpful. It sounds like we've spent a lot of time uh, on this, and uh, appreciate all the work you're doing with the conferences as well to bring some experts in and understand the different models we we have. Um, it looks like <clears throat> there's some discussion around. Uh, have we evaluated our existing model in comparison to other districts around us? That was, and how that's working, out of curiosity. So we collaborate and we talk with other districts. I, we haven't done like an analysis yeah. of it. Um, when Ronnie has come back and worked with either the learning services team, with the advisory group, um, or in separate meetings that she's had, we have probed a little bit about what other districts are doing. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, everybody's kind of in the same boat right now, trying to figure out how to best meet students' needs. And neighboring districts are doing a variety of different things. Um, I don't know that anybody, because we asked her, you know, is there somebody, is there one look for? And she said, I don't know that I can say that somewhere is doing it perfectly. There's no lighthouse district There's or no. anything like that. <clears throat> I think one of the challenges, if I can just jump in just to that quickly, um, <laughs> the districts we've worked most closely with especially as the legislation was changing rapidly five years ago, is North Shore, Issaquah, um, Snoqualmie Valley, and Bainbridge. Those are the ones that we worked quite a bit with. Um, trying to you know, find new ways to, and that's when we shifted our assessment um, tool uh, to using the Lohman matrix and trying to look at disproportionality. Um, how do we involve kindergarten, first and second grade students, which was part of the new law? How do we involve high school students, which was part of that new law? So um, I think all of the districts are now in, in the same position, which is, okay, we've got these programs. Um, we feel like by and large, we're identifying, probably over identifying students into the programs. And this isn't just a Mercer Island thing, but across King County, especially on the, the east side, 
and are we serving students in the most equitable and accessible way possible? And as though that confluence of ideas come together, I think everyone's looking at it, but with some trepidation about, um, there's some people who are very passionate about either the way it was or the way it should be and what it looks like and ultimately what's gonna be great for kids. So we are talking to those districts, especially in the consortium of collaborative schools. These are conversations that are surfacing um, all over. We are, were at that math conference, as Jamie said. Um, Jamie and I were two weeks ago. Yeah. I think two weeks ago, and it was all about detracking math. And should we be um, tracking students at all, or should we be having students more in, in uh, homogeneous class or uh, heterogeneous classrooms, um, which is what San Francisco Unified School District did. So lots of opinions out there. We're just trying to figure out what's best for Mercer Island. And is the goal to be to allow more kids to participate or fewer kids to participate? You suggested we were over-identifying, so it sounds like we want a smaller gifted program or high cap program. So there, it's important, and this came out in the survey or the review as well, um, the difference between academically talented and gifted. And um, we, I wanna say we've got something between 16 and 19% of our students identified as, as gifted. Um, when if you look at the research, it's really 3%. Um, so not to say that we don't have an amazing population, but I think sometimes we conflate academically talented with gifted. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we serve all students' needs because right now um, we have a program for highly capable, um, but I, I would contend that a significant number of the students who are receiving those services are academically talented, but I also believe a number of our students who are remaining in the general education classrooms are also academically talented, and we wanna make sure that the resources and the differentiation and, uh, and opportunities we provide to all students is accessible to all students. Thank you. Um, I had a question. So when we did the, the review last year, was that just looking at the elementary levels or K through 12? It looked K-12. It did, was K-12. Okay, so this is including what's happening at IMS as well, because I'm just hearing, yeah. okay, not just in math, but in the, reg, the E2 program that IMS too? Okay. And then uh, are we still using the ITBS? I thought we got rid of so that, we got or rid is of it only for the testing for the highly capable program? So we only use it um, as a qualifying indicator for high cap. We mm -hmm. eliminated its use for accelerated math in the fourth grade looking to fifth grade because now accelerated math is an opt-in. And so any student can choose to opt into that. Um, that's where we got rid of it, but we still do use it for high cap identification. And so would that be like a Saturday test? It's not taking time out of the school day to take that? Because not all kids are taking it then, right? So we universally screen in kindergarten. We universally test in second grade. Okay. So as part of their school day in both K and two, they do do both the COGAT and the ITBS. And then for students who qualify based on their initial screener score in the COGAT for kindergarten or first grade, then they go through a portfolio process and they may receive additional testing during the course of their school day. Mm -hmm. We also offer opportunities in January and August, so August for new families to the district, and in January, any student who's not currently in the program and not in kindergarten or second grade has the opportunity to be nominated and participate in that testing, and that occurs after school. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those work. Uh, it's nice to have this update in, in light of the study that was done last year, and I look forward to just kind of watching the progress. Um, I, the, the numbers I looked into are kind of echo the numbers that you've mentioned. I think in 1920s when, when um, <clears throat> gifted learning was really being explored, it was two standard deviations above the mean, which was 3%. And nationwide, it's 6% identification. King County, it's about 12%. On Mercer Island, it's at 16, 18%. So uh, um, I appreciate the work that you're looking into in terms of differentiated instruction and having all our teachers be able to do that because pulling that high percentage out uh, is probably doing a disservice probably to our general ed classes. And it's probably an, an, is an equity issue. So I appreciate you guys looking into this. I appreciate the you know the potential opportunity for detracking 
the tracking and perhaps allowing students to opt in to um, accelerated subjects and they may be accelerated in one area and not in the other and ha allowing that opt-in opportunity um, and you know any work that can be achieved with identifying students for that 3% or lower number that is immune to students third graders um, studying for a test that's uh, that's pretty brutal to think that uh, people are studying for this test in second and third grade to try to you know meet certain people's expectations uh, so um, you know I don't know if that's possible to have such a test that you can't study to but that would be a nice goal so thanks for your work sure it's so sad when a kindergartner comes to ask when they can retest because they failed it's tough um, I just 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 to piggyback on that I, I, I will also worry about the the three to five percent that should be in in the gifted program that aren't getting the services they need um, because we know that they are wired in a different way than than the academically talented kids so so that that's as big a concern to me as well um, I don't have any questions but thank you for the update I would echo the gratitude and um, for providing a public update on that. Uh, anytime there's change, people get nervous, um, and people are passionate about this. Uh, we know that on Mercer Island, so uh, I, I appreciate that it's uh, being presented in a transparent manner uh, with data and kind of letting us know the long-term goals that are being set and where the ship is being navigated, because it is a slow process, and so five years from now, the program will look very different, but it's going to be in small incremental steps that hopefully have the student's best interest in mind. So thank you. Uh, actually, I see you, you're, you're moving this in 2020, right? Is that when you identify the new model? So that would be our goal, would be to identify where we want to head and what that's going to look like. So by spring of next year, hopefully at this time next year, I'm presenting to you um, kind of what we've landed on based on the support and research and information from experts in the field, based on um, opportunities that our instructional coaches are going to have to come back and work and pilot some things. And so yes, the idea would be that we could identify the model by next spring. And then of course it will take several years to roll out um, as we identify what it is we're going to be doing. So identifying the model and the timeline mm -hmm. for okay. implementing. And then we, we, I know we're making some changes in special ed as well. So the goal is to do them simultaneously or to stagger them? How do you think about that? So the hope is, um, and, and we're gonna keep, I'm gonna keep working on my language as I present it so that mm -hmm. I don't try to silo things out. Um, but the hope would be that it, it becomes one movement forward. And so that as we're, we're making changes, the needs and, and what we're doing as far as a model and how we meet students' needs will be inclusive of all students, including those uh, affected by the special education review and those impacted by the highly capable review. And it's work that aligns um, very specifically with our multi-tiered systems of support uh, so that all students are receiving these supports at the first level or tier one and as they move to tier two those are extra supports that are provided which are based on a student's need whether it's um, academic behavioral social emotional so that we're supporting kids wherever they fit within um, that entire school experience Any other questions, comments, or concerns? I think it's, uh, it sounds like it's going to be, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be challenging, certainly this change. So I, I appreciate it. I appreciate also that we're doing it in a stepwise, thoughtful way and taking advantage of uh, external help as we navigate this road. And uh, I'm glad to see that your committee that you're kind of testing this with includes parents from both the high cap program as well as the regular program, so that uh, that makes a lot of sense. But I, I, I do think this is a, this is a challenging area to to navigate to, and I'm sure there are strong opinions on all sides of this. 
and that's you know it, uh, it'll be important that we do a good job on this for sure surely you're going to get some feedback yeah. thank you <laughs> <laughs> any other questions comments or concerns no okay anything else for your report no, no? okay then we will move on to section two uh, this is full governance process monitoring, and we're going to start with um, 2A, Board Policy 2020 Fundamental 5, 21st Century Thinking Skills. This is a level one report, and we are looking to find the superintendent in compliance. So just a reminder that the level one um, monitoring this year is the um, quantitative, and so you um, have Fred to go through that report with you, which is, of course, also on the agenda. Fred, when you're ready. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, just looking at it uh, in terms of the pragmatics of the report on the qualitative side, uh, the dark black line separating 1617 and 1718 is significant in two ways. Um, a reminder that as part of our review last year from the high cap um, component, we were we added third graders for one year to the EES survey uh, to be able to capture their perspectives um, relative to the highly capable program. And those were students who were either identified or not identified, um, but that was a one year um, addition of those third graders. The other um, interesting fact there is what I um, had written, and that is um, the, between 16, 17, and 17, 18, that's when the Center for Educational Effectiveness made their change with respect to how they reported the, um, the data sets. Uh, they, in previous years, any of the, they just took the total sum uh, or the total ends of all um, of anyone who took the assessment, and that became the end for every question. And then the switch to 17, 18, and now 18, 19 as the end is actually per question. So when people um, skip a question, it's not being skewed. So that's just a, a reminder on that component. So looking at the information around um, our fundamental here, this is our cultivation and fostering of thinking and process skills, such as analytical and critical thinking, cross-discipline thinking. So I really get into that critical thinking and analysis lens. Um, through, inter or through recommendations over time, uh, we've used our EES survey as uh, the backbone for this particular report um, as it comes through. And then we've also used the results from the previous year's um, teacher evaluations or, or certificated evaluations um, where we can extract out teachers who are proficient or distinguished. So there are four, four scales to the rating, uh, unsatisfactory, basic, proficient, and distinguished. And so each of the questions also map back to one of the areas in the domains. Um, looking at it um, over time, I think the, the one that jumped out to us last year but seems to have stabilized is this switch in percent secondary staff who agreed that students are provided tasks that require higher level thinking skills. We had this huge jump um, from the 60s and the 50s to the 80, uh, to 86% agree or, or strongly agree. That seems to have normalized um, out there. Um, going back, we don't know if that was because of the change in their metrics or what created such significant um, bump there, but we had that. However, when I look over time, if you look you know, holistically at the report, uh, it has been fairly stagnant over time, um, relatively high numbers, which is positive, and we've reported that before, um, but also uh, you know, there isn't a massive uh, change uh, from one year to the next. It's all within generally the standard error uh, that would be reported in here. So I put a couple notes in here. I thought that, um, you know, the, the leadership skills, uh, despite some of the things that we've continued to try to push, especially under Superintendent Koloski's leadership around students and student ownership, um, we've had small upticks, uh, as you can see, 38 to 44, 64 to 69, um, but we're not moving the needle in great ways, but I know we're continuing to find ways. You saw during site visits um, some of the students um, who were taking leadership 
uh, roles, even at the site level. So we'll continue to, to move this and see if we can't get a steady increase over time um, as we're moving forward. So with that, I'll just take some questions or maybe you just want to have a conversation about this particular fundamental. I think overall, as I said, um, I think opportunities are there. We have to continue to expand on this to push our students' thinking so that all classrooms are places of, of rigor and, um, and challenge at the level that the students require. Some, uh, thank you. Uh, some of the questions we asked the kids in the survey are kind of like, uh, what did you do at school today? I don't know, nothing, right? As, yeah. uh, you, you, you don't make the connection back to what you really did. So I, I certainly agree with you that, you know, talking to all those kids in leadership uh, groups at the site visit was, West Mercer was, was great. Uh, and that makes a real difference. So I, I do wonder if we should be thinking about participation in groups like DECA, journalism, uh, those student advisory council. You know, what do kids or what percentage of our students participate in those type of activities where they can show leadership? Other, other ones, you know, in, in Fundamental 6, we actually use a rubric around participation in world language courses as a measure of, of achieving that fundamental. We could be using participation in courses or these type of extracurricular activities as a, as, as a measure of our success. And I think DECA is one of those that, the, that shows in the qualitative report. Um, I think you're talking about the quantitative, how, yeah. you know, numbers of students, because as I was taking out information from last year's, which had the full report, um, I know that DECA was on there from the high school as an exemplar of leadership and what we're developing. And so it shows up more in the qualitative story, but not on the quantitative side. But I see your point when you don't have the qualitative with it, because we're not doing level two every year, there might be a, a missing point there. but. Those are exa ex the exact examples that I know our teachers, our yeah. principals, and others point to. And I think uh, the fact that kids are touched by it, um, you know, in a quantitative way, the participation, some kids may participate in more than one, but uh, uh, that understanding of how many kids get to experience project-based learning, uh, whether it be robotics club, DECA, um, and to to do the unions so that kids aren't counted twice would be a, be an interesting example. I think even this year in band with the uh, work we've done with you know the the Puerto Rico band and all the logistics around it and the kids had to manage the fundraising. There was a great deal of leadership. There was a great deal of problem solving. Great deal of analytics around that, and. You know, while even in a qualitative way, we might say it happened, the fact that 60% of our kids got to participate in something like that is, is huge. Uh, and finally, I would also think something like uh, my little push on uh, advanced sciences, advanced math, participation in those type of subjects would be indicative of um, critical thinking and problem solving as well. Are we growing kids who want to go into those type of subjects? And you know, the other liberal arts side, certainly journalism and DECA. Yeah, and I think it gets, um, and this isn't a, it, I agree with that. I would also say that, you know, a, a class like horticulture where it may not have the same level of advanced um, skills needed such as um, some of the calculus or whatnot, it still for some of those students requires very much advanced skills for them. So I think we have other exemplars too where the course may not appear to be as um, it's a huge problem paper. solving right, issue. Right, but there's a great, yeah. and, and we have some students that that's really pushing their thinking and challenging them in different ways too. So it is hard to know which classes exactly, but uh, I hear your point, Director D'Souza. Thank you. Um, I found those comments interesting, and I'm not sure if that's something um, we all weigh in on or if this is the right time for it as far as adding a quantitative Currently. measure. 
sorry. To a report for another time. We'll do our language review language at the next regular time. meeting, and yeah. we can look at the metrics and make recommendations at that time. Okay, great. Currently, we're just looking to find um, compliance. Great. I have no comments or questions. Thank you, Fred. Let's see. Um, thank you for the report. Okay. And um, get, yeah, given that we're going to be talking about changes in metrics the following week or following meeting. I, I try to respect that, but also rec recognize that um, we fell into that because typically we were having much larger presentations, I think, to not to confound the two. Um, so um, the C, what are, I always get these, this uh, survey mixed up. C, the EES, CE, Center for Effective Educational effectiveness. It's kind of interesting we call these quantitative metrics because they are quantitative but of pretty qualitative questions, sort of. They're kind of squishy questions. And so I, I um, <laughs> yeah, they're very squishy questions. So towards that end, I kind of, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of recognize where uh, Director D'Souza is going in terms of if we're looking at for qualitative. And this is kind of a discussion of the board, really. This isn't, uh, this isn't um, at all a, um, a critique of this report because we're in charge of the metrics. Um, but I see where Director D'Souza is kind of headed towards more quantitative stuff. And yeah, I think it's an interesting discussion I look forward to. I think it's perhaps difficult to uh, define leadership. Uh, I think, you know, the, of, uh, the student that received the school foundation scholarship took in a very effective leadership position within Bridges. Um, we have band and the section leaders and the um, drum majors. We have radio. Uh, to me, that's uh, there's a lot of leadership there, and I, th I think there's so many other potential opportunities. I think there's a group called is it HOSA. Um, which stands for health. Health occupations. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe it's attempting to kind of capture those numbers. That might be difficult, but it also might be attempting to capture um, what the district is offering that, that, that affords these leadership um, pursuits. Um, uh, let's see. And critical thinking, I think that's the kind of, I appreciate um, uh, Dr. Rundle's uh, concern about trying to uh, identify certain classes, because I think as education, many, many of the classes are critical, involve critical thinking. So that's, that's about it. I, I know this is, um, I feel like we've talked about this before, but um, one thing that's interesting to me is is the numbers, well, interesting and possibly concerning if we can ever identify the reason why. Um, I, th I think every single number goes down from fourth and fifth graders to secondary students. And what is happening, and I mean, the only thing that I can guess is, is not even guess, but why are they losing their self-confidence and self-esteem? and um, and. I mean, I think there's lots of whys, but but that's what I'm seeing from these numbers, um, and and that concerns me. Um, I don't I, I don't know how we would even go about measuring that. I would leave that to the experts, but um, to figure out how to. But but I'm just looking at these numbers, and it's it's a bummer, and especially when, like specifically, the students are involved in decisions about things that affect them in the school. Our, our fourth and fifth graders are 57 percent, which uh, to me I would think would be lower than the 44 percent of our secondary students, um, where we know that they have tremendous leadership opportunities and, and have very strong voices in terms of um, how they want their education to be. Um, I mean, class choices, activity choices, um, so uh, that's just that's just a concern in looking at this. Um, I would love to see some um, questions that uh, I mean, 
I was struggling when we were talking about the leadership, uh, kind of finding a correlation between some of the questions um, and, and even specifically asking students, do you hold a leadership role? I mean, even the ones that, that have already been said, I mean, every, every sports team has captains. Um, every club has, um, almost every club has, has officers of some sort. Um, and now those are, you know, that, that doesn't, those are less formal leaders. I mean, it's less, um, it's not as scary to be a leader of a, a smaller club than it is to like put your name out there and run for ASB. I mean, it's still, and it's, and it's just as great an opportunity. Um, not just in terms, I mean, maybe I'm just imposing my own stuff on there, but I don't know, putting your name out there in front of the school I think is kind of scary. So um, anyways, I think that there's ways that we can address that and, and even in terms of are there, I mean, we can talk about it next next meeting, but um, are there asking students if they're, if they can, are involved in a leadership activity or, can, or hold a leadership position? Um, and then also wanting to know if there are students that want them that aren't able to get them. Um, if we have kind of the same group that are leaders in all the different things and that isn't necessarily building the character and leadership skills of every, every student that wants that. So I think there's ways that we can do here that we can, I mean it's fascinating to see the more science approach in terms of the, the quantitative versus qualitative and then the, and then the social science approach, I, it, it cracks me up. Um, just, it just because, I mean, it's the world we live in, right? I mean, it's just, it's natural. But, um, but I think that there's ways that we can, that we can be, do a better job of achieving both. Can I jump in? So to Director Lurie's um, response to the difference across the grade levels, we questioned that as well. In fact, our last um, superintendent student advisory, that was the, the data that we worked with the kids on, and they were fascinated as well. In fact, several of them asked, because we had paper copies of the report, which was our most recent um, survey that we had done, asked if they could even take the report with them. So we know that there's lots of conversation that can still be had with our students as to the value of surveys. You know, we survey our kids a lot, especially at the high school, um, and so for them to understand the why of the surveys, you know, might be part of it as well. And the other piece I think we all need to acknowledge is that trend you talked about, you know, moving from fifth to the middle school, fifth grade to the middle school and then to the high school and that trend downward is a nationwide trend. Um, you look at any of the, the Gallup surveys that um, report that same kind of engagement um, factor for students and it does always trend down and it is concerning as to why aren't our students as engaged um, or identifying themselves as engaged in the high school as they are when they're at the end of elementary school. So they're great questions. I think that's a really good point about, especially with the high school students, of um, explaining to them why uh, these particular questions are being asked of them because I, I certainly have heard um, directly from some, at least s some students that, you know, it's like, oh, I just mark the same thing on each one because they get kind of surveyed out. So knowing that it really can help impact their education, I, I would hope might make, might make a difference depending on their mood of the day. Well, our high schoolers, they, they took the Healthy Youth Survey in October. They, talk, they took um, Dr. Luthar's survey in the beginning of March, and then they took this one at the end of March. And so, you know, we are asking them to provide this feedback. And I think in sometimes they get a glimpse of why it's important. Uh, other times they don't. And so then for them, it's what, what's my buy-in and what's the ownership. And then our seniors, we survey them again before they leave um, on their overall experience. So um, it is a delicate walk. Any other questions or concerns? I'll just say thank you uh, for this. I, I <coughs> do like the quant, the simplified view we've done here, and I hope it saved time by not having to do all the qualitative uh, analysis and write up too as well. So uh, thank you. Please don't take any of the comments to mean we, we want to bring that back necessarily on these simplified views. Uh, let's, let's have a vote on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we find uh, the superintendent in compliance with Fundamental Five. Second. 
Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, the motion on the floor is to find the superintendent compliant with Fundamental 5. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? No, we find the superintendent in compliance with Fundamental 5. So we'll now move on to Section 2B, Board Policy 2020, Fundamental 6, Global Awareness and Understanding. All right. Um, now we're uh, shifting into, I, we had perhaps a, a glimpse of this with the OE10 report this year um, from our elementary Spanish teachers, but uh, looking at it more holistically, a uh, couple of changes that were made um, going back to uh, last year, uh, there was the, there were, in my notes anyway, there was the ask that now we're going to be offering sixth grade Spanish, so we'd like to see what the sixth grade Spanish numbers look like. Our elementary team had, Indi had talked about this as well, so 23.2% of our sixth graders um, were taking advantage of the Spanish uh, class, which is offered for the first time in several years. Um, and then as you uh, kind of roll down, it was interesting to see that our seventh grade uh, world languages dropped off a little bit. We have been adding more electives, um, social justice classes, some other um, um, computer science classes, and, and whenever we do that, we're asking kids to make some choices. And of course, if they would like band and orchestra, there's certainly an impact there as well. So sometimes you start to, um, just spread out so many choices that they can't do everything, but um, it would be something. It will be something that we um, watch and monitor to see. We also know that with the grad requirement now fully in for all of our students, they need that two years of world language. Um, you know, our students continuing to take it in middle school and then uh, wanting to take higher levels in high school, or or what that will do. So we'll watch that as it progresses along, um, especially in our. Uh, classes, I, I took note of, you know, the 12th graders who are taking four years of world language um, went up quite a bit by this graduating class um, coming through right now, um, looking at our AP numbers and students. So students are sticking around in the courses and actually not just taking the two years. They seem to be um, pressing for, nor for more. We know our colleges um, like to see um, more. Uh, from our students, so maybe that's a driver, but certainly our 10th grade numbers are quite healthy as well. Um, thinking about the real world uh, problems in some of our courses then, our ninth graders do not have to take a social studies class um, to, b to stay on track for graduation. However, about half of them are still taking advantage of social studies classes um, with that global history, the global studies ancient civilization course. Um, and then you can see um, as they roll through that enrolled in international studies is a little bit misleading because there's so many other I classes they can take as, um, as, cr as cross credit classes so they can get that credit in a lot of different ways um, through other course offerings. Um, so you really have to look at that, that total credit in totality um, as students are, are moving through. We do know that there's some changes in the laws regarding civics and that standalone civics course, and there'll be some limitations. This will come next year to the board. We'll likely be some recommendations to changes in our grad requirement policy um, as the state's changing and becoming more restrictive about what you can count as a true civics class. So more to come on that. So I think that will impact this uh, in the future, just looking ahead. We offer the micro and the macro kind of on alternating years, uh, and so that's why we get some gaps um, in that one as well. But overall, I think our students are still continuing to try to access a number of these courses that are giving them uh, a global perspective beyond their local community. So with that, I'll turn it over to you for discussion or questions. This looked great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I think uh, I'll highlight the band example with Puerto Rico kind of does theme to uh, a lot of service though, with a lot of students. <laughs> and just to tag on to that, Director DeSouza, I would like to highlight the K-Kids at Lake Ridge that um, 
raised almost $10,000 for my former community, Paradise, to support students there. So there's a lot of those kinds of opportunities for our students um, that aren't indicated here are part of a larger qualitative report, which will come around again um, as we cycle through. But I, I, I do think we can quantify a bunch of that too. So without, without having to go to the qualitative side of it, it's the opportunities and whether kids are taking them. And I think that's, that's huge. And there's one in here, um, the number of 12th grade students enrolled in international entrepreneur course, mm -hmm. I think could qualify as a leadership um, quantitative measure as well. Um, no questions, this looks fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, this would also highlight the, the high school's margins program, which is uh, very applicable to this. So, Great. Uh, just ditto on everything that's been said. And also, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways outside of, you know, what classes students are enrolling in, in terms of, um, kind of really digging deep in some of these issues and um, whether it's whether it's traveling and volunteering in other areas of the country or world and um, and like other examples that people have already said um, where where students choose to volunteer and to raise money for and um, I think that would be an interesting addition to the qualitative part of this as well. That's great input. Um, yeah, uh, great stuff, and uh, I'll make sure that when we're going through the agenda, that when we're going through the agenda, that we block some extra time around language review for these uh, and uh, indicators. Um, and it is interesting to see how the reports have changed now that we've moved to a, a two-level system of the information that's coming and, and how we we manage that around the concept of compliance. Um, yeah, uh, I hear a lot um, on the panel tonight in the last fundamental and this fundamental, uh, discussing a lot around um, extracurriculars and what's happening outside of the school. And so with a lens to equity, I want to make sure that we also identify that we need to be providing these in aspects of our classrooms within the schools because not everyone can afford to go on the trips or to um, step out and raise funds for someone else. Not everyone is connected. Not every family is connected in that same way. And so I think uh, for me, as we look at these fundamentals of really seeing how these are embedded in each of our classrooms and into our, our building and facility cultures, um, and then we can grow beyond that to enhance or enrich, but to ensure that it's embedded in our core values uh, in the buildings I think is going to be important. So that's what I have about that. Um, if there's no other discussion or questions or concerns, I'll take a motion. I move we find the superintendent in compliance with fundamental six. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of finding the superintendent in compliance with fundamental six indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Okay, the board finds the superintendent in compliance with fundamental six. At this point, we'll move on to section 3A. This is post-monitoring language review. Uh, first, we're looking at um, Board Policy 1800-OE10 instructional program. Let's see, where are we here? So I'm going to take a moment to look at that. And is there any uh, recommendations for change? I have one. Uh, <clears throat> the 21st century body of knowledge, uh, I was thinking that we could pull out the number of the century and say an ever-evolving body of knowledge, which acknowledges that the digital age changes the knowledge students must have. Um, just a suggestion. Also, I was curious why body of knowledge was capitalized in that way, or, or even century if anybody knows. Okay. I don't think it needs it. Is it is it actually I mean I've been just I feel like I've seen it in other places and so is it like a specific phrase concept? 
21st century education? I mean, or is it just some, some things? I've just seen All I can think of is 20th century Fox, like, <laughs> you know, like that. I don't know. I can't think of any other. I saw it in, um, I was looking at a district policy for something and I saw it like just, I just saw it there also. And so I just wasn't sure if they were just kind of picking up the same thing that we were or if it actually is. Um, you know, like personalized learning and I mean something like that, but I don't, if it isn't, then I totally agree. And I don't, I actually was looking at the same thing um, when uh, kind of reviewing it myself. Um, Can I take that as a second? Was it a motion? It wasn't a formal motion, just no. a, a throwing it out there to see what kind of traction it might have or rejection flat out, that's fine too. I think it kind of simplifies it if it's just suggested as a motion and we have a second for a language change and then we can move to okay. amend. I move we change 21st century body of knowledge with initial capitals to uh, an ever evolving body of knowledge with no capitalization. Second. Okay. Discussion. I was just gonna say, um, Kind of the whole first sentence doesn't um, ring very strongly to me. I mean, I think the concept is really the, or the, the relevant point that really matters is that curriculum should be flexible and responsi responsive to a constantly changing, I don't know about global reality, but um, like that's the important part of it to me is yeah. that we evolve our curriculum. Yeah. Um, in light of lots of different things. Um, so I, I would, I don't have a specific suggestion, but that's where I see that um, point going. Yeah, I, I would ditto. I, I, that's, that's where I was thinking too, that a first sentence could be completely removed. It's pretty redundant at this point in a lot of different ways. Director Jorgensen, anything to ran? No? Uh, Director Drinkwater, how do you feel about that? Um, I'm I'm fine with that. With just striking? Just striking it. Okay. If, if others are in favor of that, that's fine with me. All right. Those are good points raised. So would you withdraw? I'll withdraw my All right, thank you. motion. So then the, the motion would be to strike the first sentence? I move we strike the first sentence. Thank you. Second. Discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor of striking the first sentence in section two, adjust to a 21st century body of knowledge which acknowledges that the digital age changes the knowledge students must have. Um, indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? No, okay, so we'll strike the first sentence. Uh, that then um, means we should change the first word of the new first sentence because the others all start with a verb, so for parallelism we need a verb to start that sentence that currently starts as curriculum should be. Because the lead-in is accordingly the superintendent will ensure that instructional staff Dot, dot, dot. We have ensure in there four times. But yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Do you go with deliver? Deliver. Utilize. Slide. I move that we change it to utilize curriculum that is flexible and responsive to a constantly changing global reality. Second, that sounds great. For the discussion? Just want to toss this to our superintendent. Are you okay with these changes or would you like to weigh in at all? Absolutely, I agree. Any other discussion? No? Okay. 
Okay, so the motion is to change uh, the new first sentence to be, let's see if I have this right, utilize curriculum that is flexible and responsive to constantly changing global reality. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Abstentions? No. Okay, so we've changed that. So number two will now read, um, utilize curriculum that is flexible and responsive to constantly changing global reality. A constantly changing global reality. Okay. Moving on. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Has everyone had enough time? Okay, so then um, I don't think we need to take any other motions or anything. We've amended, so unless there's anything else, we'll move on to the next item in the agenda. Okay, so we'll move on to 3B, Board Policy 2020. Uh, <laughs> uh, Fundamental 7, Equity and Inclusion, Superintendent's Interpretation. This is the second reading, and I think maybe on this, I wasn't here for the initial meeting, but I appreciate the discussion that happened, and I think you have some information to provide. Yes, absolutely. So the board had moved this from the presentation um, immediately, the language review rather immediately following the presentation with a suggestion of talking with the superintendent equity advisory, which we did do um, last week. But the equity advisory um, was presented with the red letter version that you see here because prior to working with them um, I did go back and work with some of our leadership team that has particular expertise and passion in this area and we worked through some of the language components and had um, leadership team weigh in which was then taken to the equity advisory for um, any input from them and there was some conversation at the equity advisory, but um, a sense that this um, presented what they felt was a strong um, interpretation of Fundamental 7. This looks very good. Thank you very much. I had um, one suggestion. Um, when I was reading the, the red part um, that says uh, the prior prioritization of social, emotional, and academic development through a racial equity lens is one critical piece of the puzzle, I, I sort of questioned why are we using the word puzzle? Like we haven't referred to a puzzle yet in this document. Um, and it's sort of nebulous, what is that puzzle? And then I think a more positive um, allusion to something would be better than that. It don't sounds like too big of a problem. Um, so I was just gonna suggest um, maybe altering it to say, I agree with the sentiment, though I wanna say that, um, that the racial equity lens is a critical factor and leave it as stressing its importance without calling it out as a puzzle. And maybe that's just me, but. I also had one question in that, while people chew on that, uh, in the sec next paragraph where uh, opportunity to was added, I think that's a great addition. Um, just wondered if it should be every student has I guess it could have an opportunity or it could have nothing there the way it is since it refers to multiple things. But. So it's, um, at this point, it's kind of feedback to how, how do you feel about that in relation to the language? Superintendent Kowalski. I don't disagree as when we talked about a piece of the puzzle and then did we want to go into, we were trying to avoid further description of what that puzzle was, but really again about the whole child. So um, one critical piece of the puzzle in educating the whole child might be 
a way to describe that. If the board prefers that language, I'm open to that as well. Or one critical piece or part of the, or even just saying of the whole child. I do like how the superintendent entitled it of, of re removing it, uh, the puzzle, which I uh, agree with uh, Director Drinkwater, but of um, one critical piece of the education. I think, I think that's an important element to speak to before you get to the student or the child. So I, I did like the superintendent's initial swing at that. Um, Superintendent Klosky, were you saying to replace puzzle with whole child or add a whole, ch of um, a, either of a whole add child more, at the end? I think um, as we work through it, one critical piece in educating the whole child. I like that a lot. Yeah. Would you like a motion for that? Um, or no, this is we don't need it. It's just her. Yeah. It's yeah. it's, and we're not voting on this. Or no, we are. You do have to approve this. So okay. to approve it with that change is what we could do it okay a viable option okay thank you for giving that um do working on that together and superintendent do you feel good with that okay good change all right so um uh, go ahead. I, just going down the line I, I wanted to add a comment or i guess it's actually a question to the president i i might be mistaken but i thought when we talked about bring the interpretation back of Fundamental 7 to the board. I thought we were also going to bring back the indicators because, uh, and I specifically mentioned that, so I don't see the indicators here. Did, was there a reason why we didn't bring the indicators at this meeting? Other than we forgot? Okay. We, no. All right. <laughs> All right, so what is, are we going to get a chance to look at those indicators next? We could bring them meeting? next time if okay. that's a concern. And if you want, we could um, bring the revised back with the indicators. Um, total, just hindsight, forgot both pieces. Apologize. We could also take a look back at indicators now, uh, unless people want to have them ahead of time to Program. Okay, yeah. yeah. Then that works great. Then we can, uh, if the board is agreeable with that, then we can table this um, until the next regular board meeting, schedule it back in for language review and review of the indicators. Um, Do you need a motion to table it or no? Just Can't we just put it on for a third language. reading? <laughs> The other thing is we could in approve the superintendent's interpretation as modified and then just bring the indicators back next next time around along with fundamental five and six language review. So it's, it'll be a pretty full plate yeah. anyway. We have a recommendation. We were just looking at your, at the brief and we did notice that you would be looking at the indicators. Even though they're not attached, we could bring them up because you did notice in your, in the brief um, for that, so you could take action on that. It's written in there. I know you also have a lot of other information to cover tonight too, so um, I just, from a technical standpoint, you could still take a look at it, because we put it in the language, we just forgot to attach it for you to view it, but we could pull that up. I think out uh, of respect for my fellow board members, I think it'd, it'd be nice if uh, everybody knew in advance and had an opportunity to kind of read them so that we probably maximize the opportunity. So I would be in favor of tabling the indicator discussion till the next meeting. Okay. So do we want to approve? I move we approve uh, the revision to the superintendent's interpretation as modified in this meeting. Second. Okay. Um, would uh, if I could modify the motion to um, to accept the superintendent's new interpretation as modified in this meeting, perhaps, because our goal is to, or do you want to bring it back for a third reading? 
I'm just reading what the recommended action was, was to approve the revised superintendent's interpretation. Are okay. you saying minus the indicators? No, a, as modified, because we've modified it. Yeah, I, I did say that, didn't I? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, I said as modified in this meeting. Okay, great. So we have a motion and a second with uh, Director D'Souza. So any discussion on that? No. All right, all in favor then? Indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? No. Okay, and then we would like to bring back review of the indicators at our next regular board meeting. And do we need a motion for that or we just put that on the agenda? Add that to the next agenda, I think. Thoughts? It would be part of um, language review, so I think you want to probably memorialize that, a motion to have the language review of the indicators for Fundamental 7. Okay. I move we table the approval of the indicators for Fundamental 7 to the next regular meeting. Second. Okay. Any discussion? No. So the motion is to table uh, language review of the indicators to our next regular meeting. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? No. Okay, so we'll move that. Okay, then we will move on to section four, partial governance process monitoring. A is board policy OE6, budget and financial planning, food services provider approval. So we have um, Ty coming forward to talk with you about uh, the whole, a little bit about the process which we have brought forward a couple of other times and we do appreciate our colleagues from Chartwell um, here to potentially answer any questions as well. Ty. Um, for years, several years, uh, the district has contracted our food services out. Um, one of the benefits of doing that is, is that it's usually cheaper um, to uh, contract um, the services. Um, but also, it, in our circumstance, it provides us an opportunity to be working with very skilled and highly competent um, managers and uh, a company that has significant experience in managing uh, these programs. Um, we are required to have no more than four years um, between bids um, for food service. Uh, our last extension for our contract ended in the 18-19 school year. Um, and so we went out to bid. We notified the board that we were going out to bid. We, uh, according to bid law, we published twice in a journal of uh, regular circulation. Um, and uh, went through the process of, of, you know, waiting for bids to come, and we opened our bids, and lo and behold, Chartwell's was our only bidder. Um, I scared staff the next day when I let them know that Chartwell's was gone, but uh, they're here to stay. Um, it was a really bad joke. It was a really <laughs> bad joke. I apologize. Um, but. Uh, we are excited to continue working with them uh, as part of their proposal this uh, this round. Um, they are raising prices by about eight cents, seven to eight cents per meal, um, and meal and meal equivalent. Um, the uh, we have full reimbursable meals at the elementaries and the middle school, and we have a la carte meals and meal equivalents at the high school because the high school is not on the national lunch program. Um, as such, one of the things that they're proposing to do is to hire two uh, new culinary chefs um, within our district to help manage the kitchens and, and uh, help increase some efficiencies. The costs have also increased because minimum wages and benefits have increased as well. Um, and we're seeing price increases throughout the region. Um, so it, coming away with a seven to eight cents per meal increase is, it's a pretty good deal for us. Um, one thing that we will note uh, is that our 
the price that the district charges to students has not been increased in over 10 years? I believe it was eight years ago. Eight years ago. Um, so it was about eight years ago. Um, and uh, we are also required to run food service programs in the black. Um, the last several years, we haven't, we barely, barely either managed to stay on the black side or we've been in the red side. Um, so as we bring our budget to you this August for approval, we will be requesting price increases um, for the meals um, of about 25 cents per meal. Uh, that will bring the elementary meals up to 375 and the middle school meals up to $4. Um, and this is, these are comparable prices within the region um, and that will allow us to A, maintain the cost that we need to to stay solvent with our food service program, but also to ensure that those students that are unable to buy their lunches will also be provided for within the program. So we'll have we'll have sufficient resources to ensure that they are covered. So any questions? Yeah, um, thank you for doing this and thank you to Chartwells for bidding and your continued service. Um, a few comments, um, I guess I have three questions. One, would uh, just a curiosity question in terms of uh, government bidding. Uh, had there been more, are, are we required to take the lowest bidder or are we, or is there some wiggle room there? Uh, so we are, we are required to, with, in certain circumstances, take the lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. We are able to define certain criteria okay. um, within the scoring scheme of the bid. Um, the lowest cost may not have always driven the winner. Um, so, all right, thank you. Um, uh, I did think, I think I heard something on NPR the other day, and they were talking about uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, with uh, uh, students without financial means um, having a differential service and it being very um, uh, inappropriate and also talking about uh, archaic ways to collect on student lunch debt and so to the extent that we're ensuring all our students are, are getting equitable lunch opportunities and there's, in a way, um, grant or, or some sort of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, philanthropic type of things. Thank you for ensuring that all our students feel comfortable in that cafeteria. And then lastly, uh, this ties into our facilities discussion eventually. Uh, with with uh, Northwood and IMS, I believe, um, uh, part of the selling point to the public into this in, uh, was a much larger kitchen. Uh, that could handle uh, food preparation. And we don't need to address this now, but in the future, it, it would be nice to hear um, uh, how that's worked out and how that might help inform the facility discussion going forward uh, in terms of those improved uh, meal preparation areas. So. I think Carol Buss would be thrilled to come into those discussions about facilities because she has um, direct experience in certainly both of our new schools kitchens versus our older school kitchens and how those work efficiently or not for um, definitely staff but students as well. I think the uh, other question that has also come up has been what food Health food, healthy food standards do we utilize? And I don't know if they've changed yet officially or not, but uh, hopefully we're maintaining uh, the healthy food standards at least that we've had in the past year. Uh, when we put out the bid, um, we specifically stated within the guidelines of the, the request um, for proposal that we maintain, um, uh, what was it, 100% whole grain rich group uh, foods on the menu. Uh, that's a requirement that is no longer required within the National School Lunch Program, um, as well as fresh fruits and vegetable guidelines um, that we set up um, within the RFP to make sure that we are still meeting and exceeding the standards that we have today. 
um, for the healthy food. Our kids are probably some of the healthiest eaters around um, because Carol and Charles has done such a fantastic job of getting them exposed to these uh, healthy foods and making it fun and helping them understand the value of it. Um, so uh, I wanted to make sure that in the unfortunate event that if Charles ever does sail off into the sunset and we get someone else that those requirements and those standards that we currently have, which would be above the current um, guidelines, would main, we would maintain that moving forward. We have fresh salad bars at all of our elementaries and actually had to purchase new ones so our, our littles could really see and, and serve themselves. <laughs> so many of the board directors would um, like to have lunch, particularly at one of our elementaries. I would be more than happy to host with Carol um, lunch at any of our elementary schools. Thank you. Any other questions, concerns? All right, then I would, I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the district's contract with Compass Group USA. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? No. The board approves the district's decision to contract with Compass Group USA, and thank you for staying with us. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll now move on to 4B, Board Policy OE11, Facilities and Capital Assets, Mercer Island High School Entry Project Contract Approval. Um, so we are requesting the board approve tonight the contract between the district and Bailey. Um, this is for the secure entrance at the high school. Um, we'll be uh, doing some construction and modifications to the front entrance, adding a secure vestibule with uh, communication windows, service windows uh, in the existing office, as well as some furniture reconfiguration within the main office to be able to service those windows effectively and increase sight lines and increase security, uh, as well as some opportunities for efficiencies within the office as well. Um, we did go out to bid for this project as required. Um, we have actually bid the project twice. Um, there was, um, the initial estimate was, we found to be a bit low. Um, so we asked the engineers to come back with another uh, estimate, uh, which was, um, became much closer to what the, the construction companies that have bid uh, came back, well, company. Um, Bailey was the only company to bid on the project. Um, it is, this is a very hot market in terms of construction projects. It is a very highly active season for Bailey. Um, Bailey Construction uh, has a great reputation with the district. Um, they did fantastic work at Northwood and we really appreciate them um, uh, bidding on the contract. Uh, the contract, the bid came in a little bit above the revised estimate because of of the material um, variations, not variations, material choices, choices of materials uh, within the, the decoration of the uh, secure entry, the vestibule. Um, this allows us to be able to move forward uh, with the contract uh, and uh, start work on the project as the day after school is out. Uh, any questions? Just a comment. Thank you for doing this. It's really neat to see uh, that Bailey was uh, is a submitted a bid and won the bid. Uh, they did a wonderful job with Northwood. They're also a local contractor, so really appreciate that. And uh, as I mentioned this before, I think it's it's unfortunate we're having to spend money for this just in terms of the security concerns. But I think it's I'm glad we are. And it just an acknowledgement, I think, that this is coming out of the six-year capital levies money, and a thank you to the public for continued support of that. And um, and the the, desi the design we were shown before looked like it was very thoughtful and was consistent with the high school architecture. Thanks. OK, 
Okay, I'm not seeing much else in the way of discussion. Um, and so, uh, the president would entertain a motion to approve the district's contract with Bailey Construction for the high school entry project. So moved. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those say nay. Any abstentions? No. Okay. So the board approves the district's contract with Bailey Construction for the Mercer Island High School entry project. Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Section five. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? I did have one question. I yes. apologize on um, the uh, Northwest Educational Service District agreement. Uh, should I? ask the question now or should I uh, make a motion to remove that from the you consent? can just go ahead and ask for it to be removed from the consent agenda and any individual board member can do that okay and so I'll go ahead and, uh, with the intention of still agree uh, of uh, still passing this but asking a question about this I I uh, do I modify the motion do I amend the motion to I'll withdraw my motion okay Thank okay. you. Um, I'll make a motion that we uh, uh, approve the consent agenda uh, less the Northwest Educational S Service District agreement to be discussed after this. L. Do you want section L? Sure. Okay. Is there a second for that? Second. Okay. Motion on the floor is to approve the consent agenda. Uh, modified to remove L, the Northwest Regional Data Center, and we'll agree, no. Yes, okay. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? No, okay, so adding in um, what was L, the Northwest Regional Data Center NWRDC Renewal Agreement. Um, just, it looks like there's a pure per pupil fee, and, and according to Appendix B, there's a schedule. There's fiscal only, student only, and full service. It looks like there's a choice, uh, just a clarity in terms of which one we're opting for. So this is Northwest Northwest Regional Data Center is uh, the the service provider for the Skyward system. So we use Skyward for fiscal, human resources, and student data. Um, so we, per, uh, we are a full service district. Okay. Thank you very much, that's all I had a question on. I'd like to make a motion to approve that. Sure. <laughs> so moved. Okay. Second. Okay, and the motion is to approve the Northwest Regional Data Center Renewal Agreement. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you for going through that exercise, Board. Sure. Well, and it, it's great to use that as we've discovered in our work in the 1000 series that um, and it can happen also at the, the time of adopting the agenda that any individual board member can remove something from the consent agenda simply by request. Okay. Uh, moving past the consent agenda, we'll now move into section six, the superintendent's report. Um, no major reports. We had our discussion at the beginning of the agenda. Just a um, welcome in the audience to Maggie Ty Tucker. I had the opportunity to meet her yesterday, so welcome. And for the audience at home, Maggie Ty Tucker is running for position three on the school board, unopposed. Okay, moving on to section seven. Uh, board announcements, inquiries, and reports. Uh, 7A, legislative report. No report from here. Okay. Uh, I have no report. Um, 
other than to say that the legislative committee is getting together at the end of this month and the end of next month in preparation for uh, legislative assembly uh, later on in 2019. So the work has begun. <laughs> um, moving on to 7B, school-based counselors appreciation letter to city council. Uh, directors Drinkwater and D'Souza, would you like to speak to that? I just want to say that David did an outstanding job doing the first draft, and I just did a few edits. So this is really um, uh, like 95, maybe to 98 percent his work, and um, I thought he did a really nice job. And then uh, apparently my name was spelled wrong, and I didn't catch that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, and then there was maybe one other edit. I'm not sure if that's already been dealt with in the final that we're going to sign tonight. No, I don't think so. I think we'll okay. have to come into the office and get it signed. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then Deborah Lurie needs to be vice president instead of director there. So I think those were some, some changes that were noted. And then did you want to say anything else? I just want to say thank you. Um, I it, when when I had in my head like what to thank for you, you just absolutely perfectly represented it, and I thank you for spending the time to do that. Same echo. Uh, thank you for doing that. I only had one question. Um, was uh, and it might be a small thing, and it might be a, a legal thing. Um, it would be, I guess, in the second paragraph. Um, do, 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 the word refusal um, in that first sentence there. Additionally, we'd like to recognize the city's refusal to accept um, as opposed to decline or... Um. Yeah, I, I like decline. So having it say we'd like to recognize the city's Decline, or because declination sort of awkward word. That is. Um, declinal, is that what you said? <laughs> oh, no, you didn't say that, and there wasn't you. I heard that somehow. Um, um, refusal is a very negative sounding mm -hmm. word, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. It, it is a negative sounding word. I actually thought about that too, but, but I think that. I don't think that's a bad thing in this yeah, situation. Um, th it's, it's the city's program. They're funding it with their dollars, and um, not taking from someone else is, I think that's a strong stand. Yeah, so and we go on I to explain why that's such a good thing. Right. So, uh, But I don't, but I I think don't have a strong feeling on what word up. we use, but I don't think that refusal is a bad thing in this situation. That was the only thing I wanted to throw out because okay. it, it seemed like a strong word, but I, yeah. I think with mm -hmm. that kind of backing behind it and intent, yeah. it makes absolute sense. Yeah, I think that's the way the um, the city characterized it in their write-up as well. So I use that same language, but uh, okay. I think I think that's fair then. Okay, then I withdraw. <laughs> um, great. Any other comments or um, then I think. Uh, the action would be to approve, approve um, the draft appreciation letter to the city council um, as modified. As so corrected. moved. Sorry, as corrected. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the appreciation letter to the city council uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstention? No. And let it be known it was approved unanimously. <laughs> uh, Mr. Board President, uh, should we see if everybody's available to stop by by a certain time tomorrow to sign to just so that in a timely manner? Is everyone available to start by tomorrow? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Someone can sign on my behalf. That's me. No. We would never sign on your behalf. It's permission. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay. So I think we can do it. Everyone can get there in a timely manner to I will set I will do my best. If I can't, yeah. I hereby give permission to a representative to sign on my behalf. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for doing that work um, of putting that letter together. Much appreciated. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I'll, I will add, Tracy added a, a lot of very powerful words to the uh, document, so thank you very much. Okay, moving on to 7C, announcements and inquiries. <laughs> Director D'Souza. Um, I'll just say we had uh, Lake Ridge uh, recognition of teachers today, and uh, always lovely to go back to my my kids home school and uh, and see that I, I also uh, am on the pack there but I don't get to go and see so many teachers uh, really brings a tear to your eyes to see all these wonderful people uh, with all these little young ones uh, we're, we're very blessed thank you I um, went to a couple of meetings in the last week and a half uh, Island Park's last pack meeting which has been a pleasure to serve on. Uh, and uh, the superintendent's teaching and learning advisory committee this week, which was great, and um, got some review of some things and some presentations of th things and uh, things to come on the instructional materials. And it was a really great meeting, um, packed room. Um, really nice to see all the people in there too. So it's been a pleasure to serve there as well. No report. Um, I just want to um, thank West Mercer for hosting us for our site visit last week. Um, as an alum of West Mercer, it's very different than when I attended, but it was um, it was really great experience. We saw some really great teaching and um, student leadership. Uh, so thank you for that great morning. Um, I don't think it was before, I think it was before the last board meeting, but I just want to say I'm the rep on the Northwood PAC uh, this year, and, and they have definitely struggled um, to have members, uh, parent members on their PAC. And so I just want to give a shout out to anyone who might be watching or listening um, that they would love to have more parent participation in their PAC. Um, one thing that was, um, they're really willing to be flexible in terms of days of the week or days of the meeting, time of the meeting, um, and are really looking for that parent feedback. Um, they were thrilled with um, their thought exchange group that came. It was a very, it was a large group that came. So, so they know there's parents out there who are paying attention, which is excellent. Um, and if uh, PAC meetings need to happen at 7.30 at night, they are very happy to do that. So if you're able to participate and want to, please reach out to um, the administration there. Um, just want to congratulate the girls lacrosse team on their state championship um, and wish the boys the best of luck in their championship uh, Saturday, right? And um, I know that there's at least another. I know golf had theirs this week. I don't know the results. Um, and I know that water polo was also this weekend and I think track is this weekend as well. So good luck to all of our student athletes and congratulations to those of you who have performed and those of you who were about to, good luck um, to you. Um, I had uh, the great opportunity to attend the equity conference yesterday. Um, I meant to bring my little brochure, but um, it was a great conference. If you haven't been, I highly recommend it. Um, really good conversations and good presentations. It is the WASDA. Well, yes. Oh, the WASA and WASA and another group were listed on there too. So, anyways, the WASDA Equity Conference. Um, one, I just wanted. I just want to mention one takeaway that I found interesting. There were a lot of really interesting things. I'm not. I'm not necessarily suggesting this this is just something that hit home to me because we've been talking about it and hearing about our last couple meetings in terms of curriculum choices and class offerings um, with regards to, to high ca cap participation things like that um, one of the um, one of the groups I went to um, they were talking about um, from 
board to uh, board to the classroom and, and things that we can do um, in terms of um, making sure that that uh, equity is um, being addressed in our in our schools um, and one of the one of the items they talked about was um, that there's evidence to show that focus on the middle school focusing at the middle school level I'm sure our amazing leadership team knows this but I was I confirmed stuff for me too um, the focus at the middle school level for engaging students and removing barriers that if you're waiting until high school um, that it's too late and one of the things that um, some of the things they talked about were transition goals both um, entering the middle school and en exiting the middle school in terms of um, planning for their high school uh, curriculum choices looking at it in terms of um, using using a student a counselor parent student meeting in eighth grade to discuss career and education goals and pathways and then being able to register for high school classes um, to do those pathways I'm sure those things are happening um, I'm just not sure that everyone that all parents know that they're happening and um, it was just to be able to um, really kind of bring consolidate the understanding of why classes are offered what classes are important to take um, with the transitions and pathways um, I thought it it's sure made a lot of sense to me and and like I said I think it's happening but um, but that's just something that kind of hit home um, our middle school is doing such amazing work with our students um, that uh, you know just I, I just wanted I, I was able to recognize what great work our middle school was doing with our students and um, being able to bring in the parents uh, as part of those conversations the, as much as possible um, I know that I appreciated um, I know that uh, in fifth grade the counselors go to the elementary school the middle school counselors go to the elementary schools to meet with the students who are in 504 and IEP plans to um, discuss their needs make sure they're getting their um, accommodations and, and the appropriate accommodations and then and not necessarily registering for classes but but making sure that that their class schedule is going to meet their needs um, and the more that th that can be done across the board um, to have individualized um, meetings and opportunities I know they're there and I know our staff is happy to do it but that our parent community knows that and can take advantage of that is only going to, I think, um, improve our um, schools for everyone. So um, it was a great conference and um, a, a fun day. So thanks for letting me go. That's awesome. <laughs> I was sad that I couldn't go this year, but yeah, I love those. Um, yeah, looking at our, our site visit to West Mercer, I, it dawned on me that was the first time I had officially entered West Mercer as, <laughs> as a board director. Um, and I'm in there a lot uh, as a volunteer, so um, it, it, was, it was interesting. Um, uh, I recently attended the uh, last Superintendent's Equity Advisory Council meeting uh, where we did um, discuss uh, fundamental seven and the, the language and the interpretation there. Um, I just want to say a um, uh, hat tip to that group of individuals. It's a, a new group. It's a new feeling this year. Um, they've really worked all year to establish some new mission and vision and direction. Um, and I want to also um, thank the superintendent uh, for leadership in that room and also to our partners from the Puget Sound Educational Services District who came in to help facilitate a lot of that work. Um, it's really exciting looking into where they're going to head with that next year. Um, and a little sad knowing that since I've, I've had the pleasure of being on that as a liaison for two years that I'll, I'll likely be giving that up um, soon. So it's been so transformative. Um, yeah, so great work happening there. Um, I also sat in on last night's community meeting um, using Thought Exchange to go over the new draft mission, vision, and values. We had a guest celebrity in the room last night. Senator Wellman joined us uh, and weighed in. Um, we had some interesting discussions, and uh, I got to get a little sneak peek at um, some of the hot topics rising to the top, which was uh, fun. So I'm looking forward to getting all of those results back and, and going through them as a leadership team. Um, and then 
finally, um, I want to congratulate uh, our Director of Communications, Craig Deginger, and uh, the district for hitting 2,000 likes on Facebook <laughs> um, <laughs> and follows. So way to go. I know there was a big push and that just happened yesterday or today. I had yeah. one other thing. With one other. Sure. Um, I think that's all that I have. Um, I don't know. You know, this time of year, I always just wish there were more events. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a busy time of transition, so I'll end my report there. Tracy, you have some additional stuff. That's great. Uh, <laughs> I um, meant to say this in my earlier part of my report. Um, uh, I'd taken a look at um, some of the links that Nancy Weil sent us um, about a sustainability policy in another district, and it was interesting to see how that seemed more board led and then it's trickling down to the community. I'm really proud of our community, how it started as grassroots and now it's being suggested that we have a, a policy um, to cover that. So I think it would look differently than those um, documents that she sent us links to, but I'd be really interested um, in taking a look at that this summer and I'd like to invite Director Lurie, because we had a brief conversation about it, um, to work on that maybe and have it uh, as an agenda item potentially in um, August or September or October, whenever it would be deemed appropriate um, by the agenda team of you three. So. I would be happy to, as long as you can um, schedule some time in between all of your travels. Yeah, well, I'm here around more in the <laughs> summer. I was thinking we could get, meet I'm at the Shore Club. <laughs> yes, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to do that. So. One question on that. Is that creating a new policy, or is that perhaps pigtailing on an existing policy that might uh, be close proximity to that? I think we could explore a few options and, and bring a kind of a recommendation or two yeah. to discuss. We had, yeah, we had like a two minute discussion and, and talked, you know, the pros and cons of policy versus resolution and um, I think it's just starting that initial conversation to see what might be a good fit for us. So that would be a committee of two, would we need authorization or anything? Um, it's a committee of the board but I think it I don't know that we need to go through formalizing it. Well, we could certainly formalize it. Um, that would be great if we could, because then we can be sure to plan for it in the future agenda items. So if one of you would like to make that motion, or maybe the two of you would like to motion and second. I move uh, that we form a committee of two to take a look at a potential sustainability um, policy or resolution or some such thing um, to tie it together. Uh, uh, over the next few months uh, with uh, myself and Director Lurie, Vice President Lurie. Second. So it's a motion um, to create a committee of two uh, to discuss a potential sustainability policy resolution or something or other over the next couple of months. <laughs> okay, any discussion? Uh, no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, committee of two. All right, and we will work to uh, place on an agenda. Were you thinking August uh, to bring that or sooner? Uh, not sooner than August, no. We don't, I know we've got a lot on our plates yeah. to round out this year and August may be packed as well, so that's right. why so I'd August, leave it to September. you three to okay. figure it out. Okay, we'll look at that with the agenda. Okay, are there any other um, so at this point, I think we could take a motion to adjourn our regular meeting. We are going to follow this up with a study session, um, but that's uh, looser, so we could bring our regular meeting to a close if the board so desires. I move we adjourn. I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. So wait, I think we did. I think I think uh, we did a mistake. Oh, we don't adjourn. That means there's no need to session. Okay. Yep. I move we cancel that last motion. <laughs> okay. Canceled. Then we will, um, let's take a 10 minute break. It's a good timing. Um, if that's okay with everyone, uh, bio break, get a drink of water, and we'll reconvene at 8 o'clock with our study session. That's good. Okay. Thank you. 
I stopped it. 